I hear all the time people saying, well, at, at the heart and at the basic soul that all these religions are basically the same. When people say that to me, it tells me immediately they don't know anything about the world religions. And they know even less about the Christian faith. Welcome to LED Live. It's a show where we use the light of Christ to expose the darkness found in media and our culture today. And today we have Stephanie Griffin with us. Welcome. Hey. How are you? I'm great. That's Happy awesome. Happy to be here. And then we also have Eric Wilson. We haven't seen you in a while. How you doing? It's good to see you. <laughs> So we're going to be discussing the emerging church today, and that could mean different things to a lot of different people. So I'm going to hand it over to you to first, like, set the stage as to what that even means and then take us through the topic. Okay. Well, um, the emerging church, what is it? You know, it's, it's very broad and most people don't understand what it means, but we're going to find out today. We're going to show a video that kind of introduces the topic, and then we're going to go and talk about it a little bit. Okay. It's not uncommon for people to seek God during times of hardship, and in some ways, the pandemic has been no different. But even before COVID, a growing number of Americans were moving away from organized religions, and the pandemic didn't do anything to stop that trend. A survey this month from the Pew Research Center found 29 percent said they had no religious affiliation. That's up six points from 2016, with the millennial generation leading that shift. So with the pandemic dragging on into its third year, CNBC's Seema Modi tells us faith leaders are trying new ways to reach out and touch someone. More progressive religions are gaining popularity. Middle Collegiate Church grew by 500 members during the pandemic, even though its actual building was destroyed by a fire last year. We've put social justice and democracy in the middle of faith in a way that really speaks to young folks. Some critics would say you're changing their relationship with God. What you're doing is, is different than the traditional approach. What's your response? I'm so glad I'm changing their relationship to God. If that's what we're doing, that's exciting to me. I'm trying to get God out of the box. Member Perrin Allen grew up in a conservative Christian household, but as a gay man, struggled to feel accepted. You had to do things the way the Bible says literally, but I feel like the Bible and Jesus Christ believed in love no matter what. And I feel like I found that at middle. It's not just love. Since the pandemic, spiritual leader Deepak Chopra says people are yearning for connection and community. The pandemic showed us that people don't like uh, isolation. Chopra's foundation is hosting retreats where the spiritually minded come to heal, meditate and connect. We are creating both online and offline communities globally. Rabbi Stanton views these changes as a spiritual awakening, not just for people, but the faith community as a whole. Institutions are going to shift dramatically and we are all going to be the better off for it. Whether at churches like this one, on social media, or at spiritual retreats, religious leaders we spoke to say the pandemic has fostered a stronger connection to spirituality in younger generations and see it as an opportunity to engage with them. So, uh, did you hear? It's built on change, right? They, mm. It's the church reimagined. Mm. So what does that look like? How do we reimagine church? Mm. We heard some key words in there. Um, the gentleman um, said that uh, the Bible was literal, but he feels. That's right. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Feels. Yeah. And then you heard yeah. change. And then you heard meditate. You heard spiritual retreats. So you kind of get an inkling of where we're headed with this. Taking God so, out of the box. Yes, out of the box. Yeah. Right? You know, it was, what was interesting to me was when that man said, you know, the Bible, you know, is supposed to be taken literally, but I feel all of a sudden truth becomes how he feels not what god's word says and that's that's very dangerous mm -hmm. my experience mm -hmm. over over the word of god you know um the people in this video they seem to be fighting against uh the feeling of being isolated or removed they are wanting this community uh, but that's something that was already instituted in God's word. It's something that God understands that we need as human beings. Mm -hmm. And he says, 
the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable, not just for doctrine, you know, not just to be taken literally, mm -hmm. but for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly fur furnished unto all good works. And included in all of that, it's kind of hitting all the areas of life, including mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. And I think it's when we remove ourselves from the ideal that we start feeling these going to the i feel you know mm -hmm. i feel the emptiness i feel this i feel that and then trying to compensate for what god has already mm -hmm. provided in his mm -hmm. word and then there's this caution in revelation revelation 22 that we should not be changing the words of the bible yeah. the words yes. of god's yes. word breathed Amen. to us mm -hmm. and so it's it's great that when you know the truth, you're able to pick up on those buzzwords and be like, mm, well, no, something's mm. wrong mm -hmm. here. Even if you don't exactly know what, you have that intuition that's Holy Spirit given mm -hmm. to be like, yeah, let's look deeper into this because something isn't quite right. Yeah, I love what, that. What I think is interesting is the need to change the system without changing ourselves, right? Mm. It's just like taking that aspect out of it. And when we come to Christ, there is a transformation process, mm. but it seems like people don't want to transform. Mm. They want God to do the transforming to how they feel like he should be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem. It would that's also be problem. interesting to hear what God is to the people in this video, a lot of the times our image of God comes from our person to person experiences. Mm -hmm. And so the, either the traumas we experience or the just difficult times when it comes to an individual, now all of a sudden God's picture is now that, that person's face or the experience or what have you. Mm -hmm. And so in trying to change the system, maybe it's not necessarily the system that's broken, it's our interpersonal relationships, right. mm -hmm. which is the point Amen. of those is to grow our character, is to survive mm -hmm. above that, see above that into um, the perfection of who God is and how he can transform us, right. which is the point that to you're bringing To be made up. into his image rather than making yeah. him into our, our image. image. I, I was surprised that it was just 29%. I thought it was higher than that. I thought it was gonna be higher too. And yes, there surprised. is a push to secular secularism. Is that mm. the word <laughs> in this mm. country? Uh, and they pinpointed the group uh, m millennials. I think the number is even higher with Gen Z. Mm. Have you identified why that's the case? Yeah, that's What's the postmodern mindset, mm. right? To so postmodern, we don't have dividing lines. We're not nationalists. We are we citizens of the world. Mm. Uh, we're not a Baptist or a Methodist. We are. Uh, non-denominational we bring everything together we just take down those walls and of course it's experience-based so my truth is no longer science no longer facts but my experience mm -hmm. so th mm -hmm. that's consistent with with what's happened since world war ii all right so our next video is going to be a little more descriptive about emergent worship what it looks like My name is Brian McLaren, and the book is called Why Did Jesus, Moses, the Buddha, and Muhammad Cross the Road? Christian Identity in a Multi-Faith World. You know, the emerging church is an interesting term. For some, it is the way that a church expresses itself. It's the methods that they use. It's the way that the place looks. It's full of couches rather than pews, this sort of thing. And for others of us, it's much more deep than that. It's about how we view the world. 46 minutes past the hour right now. Good morning to you. So some 2020 Democratic candidates seem to like to keep religion separate from politics, but evangelicals represent a pretty large segment of the electorate. Our next guest tells The New Yorker that many moderate evangelicals would be happy to vote for Democrats, but they feel the party overlooks them during campaigns. Joining us is Pastor Doug Patchett of Solomon's Porch Church in Minneapolis. He created an organization to make the religious left more visible and to help Democrats learn how to court evangelical voters. Patchett also worked on behalf of the Obama campaign in 2008. Good morning to you, sir. Thank you for joining us. Somewhere along the way, the Jesus movement got hijacked. Rob Bell has been raising a lot of eyebrows lately for his evolving views about Christianity and the Bible. Some evangelicals are calling it twisted scripture, also inspiring charges of heresy. And it's my honor to welcome to the show live in studio, Rob Bell, everybody, Rob Bell! The religions have failed. So we are going through a revolution because these great traditions have to be expanded. I believe the, the man is a false teacher. I believe he's a, a heretic. He is a 
a paradigm shifter uh, more than he realizes. Men like Rob Bell, they claim to be working of God. He wants to dull the voice of God. Women's rights, LGBT, minorities, love of our Muslim neighbors. If those aren't all basics, you're done. Rob Bell should fear God because he's a liar and he's a heretic. Church pastor Rob Bell has been raising a lot of eyebrows lately for his evolving views about Christianity and the Bible. Bell and his wife Kirsten recently appeared with Oprah Winfrey on her Super Soul Sunday program where he suggested the Bible is irrelevant to today's culture. T take a look at this short clip. One of the oldest aches in the bones of humanity is loneliness. I mean, it's one of the things that goes way, way back. Loneliness is not good for the world. And so whoever you are, gay or straight, it is totally normal, natural, and healthy to want somebody to go through life with. Hi, I'm Rick Warren, and welcome to The Purpose Driven Life. The Purpose Driven Life is more than a book. It is a 40-day journey, a spiritual pathway to help you discover, develop, and fulfill God's purpose for your life. And now, in grateful glory to God, would you welcome your pastor, Rick Warren. <laughs> Hey, buddy. All right. Hello, Saddleback. Good to see ya. He is risen. Okay, so here tonight we're learning uh, how to play poker with Pastor Rick Warren, teaching us how to win the hand we're dealt. What's the fourth card in our hand? The moment you change the channel, it, the, the temptation loses its power on you. Do not listen. Here's a pastor telling this, do not resist temptation. Do not resist temptation? Yeah. And let me tell you why. Says the pastor. Yeah, let me tell you why. And somebody else made the rock. But do you believe in equality for all? Of course uh, your do. heart. Right. Of course See, and do. this is where I think I took issue with you before, do. and I will again, because <laughs> how can you really, mm -hmm. as a Christian man, yeah. and a, a great man, how can you espouse genuine equality? Yeah if you don't allow gay people the same rights to get married yeah. as straight people? Yeah. That's a question that many, I think, would love to hear the answer I'd like to. to reposition it this way. At this time, I call upon Dr. Rick Warren, pastor of the Saddleback Church in Lake Forest, California, to provide the invocation. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Father, everything we see and everything we can't see exists because of you alone. Help us to share, to serve, and to seek the common good of all. May all people of goodwill today join together to work for a more just, a more healthy and a more prosperous nation and a peaceful planet. First, I applaud Davos for having this session. And I applaud you for coming to it. It really says more about you than it does about us. If you are a global business leader, you need to understand that the future of the world is not secularism. It is religious pluralism. We have far more in common than what divides us. When you talk about Pentecostals, Charismatics, Evangelicals, uh, Fundamentalist, Catholics, Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, on, on, and on, and on. Well, they would all say, we believe in the Trinity, we believe in the Bible, we believe in the resurrection, we believe salvation is through Jesus Christ. These are the big issues. That was a lot. It was yeah, well, a lot. that was a lot. <laughs> Um, but what I didn't yeah. hear, what I didn't hear was the answer to the feeling of loneliness. Mm. Did, did you hear it? Did Just I miss that something? you need someone. Yeah. Right. That was it. Mm. And then you break down the walls, you know, it's relationship. Yeah. Right. Do you know, do you know something that's interesting to me? When we see each of these different leaders from the emergent church movement, 
normally we think, okay, these are pastors, these are writers, they're authors. They have got an influence in the church. But on that video that we just saw, each of these men not only is influencing the way we do church, the way we believe God's word, but they're also influencing our culture. In the news, what they're doing with the UN, with the World Economic Forum, with Rob Bell, all of them are influencing the way Christianity is viewed. And that's scary because they don't stand on God's word. No, the focus is justice, social justice. That's the new gospel. I appreciate these pastors for just talking <laughs> because it makes our job easy. Um, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, it tells us exactly how to identify truth versus error, especially when it comes to teachers and those mm. who preach. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. But every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And it, it goes on and on. But it's it's not just the fact that Jesus come in the flesh. It's the gospel on a whole, and it's biblical teaching. Mm -hmm. And so if someone isn't teaching the, the gospel, do not resist temptation. That's in direct conflict. <laughs> and yeah. what Jesus says, resist mm -hmm. the devil and he will yeah, free yeah. from you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then you know, all right, false prophet, move on. <laughs> you know what I mean? So the fact that a lot of people are being deceived and in Matthew 24, Jesus is mm -hmm. instructing us to not be deceived. It's really heartbreaking to, to see because the evidence is there. If, if we were reading our Bibles, the deception wouldn't yeah. be so big. At least yeah. these people wouldn't have such a big following yeah. from Christians, Bible-believing Christians. I, I think where that where that could um, stem from, though, is because in the beginning, these pastors could have been biblically sound until you have a little bit of pride come out mm. <laughs> as you start getting bigger. Um, because I've also experienced that. Um, like when you just are fall, like you're watching some pastor do a sermon and he's part of a smaller church and just as they get bigger and bigger and bigger they start mm -hmm. compromising truth just over time and so there's also that relationship that they could have had with the smaller church first and then people could have been spreading that around and then they felt like because usually they say that um you'll believe information when it comes from a friend versus mm -hmm. you know like that's just you'll you'll trust your friend over mm -hmm. anything else and so it could be that too just like that slow build up of okay yeah i can trust this person and so when when they do get big and other people start following mm -hmm. along at that point it's just yeah and that's exactly what ha what happens you have these church leaders who are buddy buddy with their parishioners and not parishioners but their their people and it instead of being a like a pastor they're just like you know joe pastor joe first name very very casual they're flattening that hierarchy everybody's on the same level and it's just relationship it's a social club mm -hmm. and so they you're right they form bonds with these people mm -hmm. they look up to them and that replaces the word of god mm -hmm. yeah and in the beginning part of the clip when the i, I don't know who he is but he was talking about the emerging church and how it could look like replacing pews with couches. Mm -hmm. I don't see anything quite wrong with that. I mean, you see the Christian church in the beginning was meeting in homes, you know, mm -hmm. and, and having Bible study. That's great. It's it's the message that is concerning. I don't think calling for change means there's a lack of love. And God has our best intentions at heart. Mm -hmm. And because of his love for us, he calls for change in different areas of our lives, or at least abstinence in certain areas mm -hmm. of our lives, mm -hmm. even the ones that we hold dear. And becoming Christians is a call for sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So to remove that and say, this is the emerging church, the new church of what? Can we even call it Christian at that point if you remove Christ's principles from it? Well, that's one of the things about the emerging mm -hmm. church. It, you don't have to be Christian. We'll get there, but you don't have to be Christian. This is meant to embrace everybody, to bring everybody together. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you do that just on your common, your common pieces, um, pizza parties, <laughs> you know, whatever social club is happening at your church, whatever social justice programs are happening, dental clinics, that sort of thing. The goal of where this goes once you get to the end, you realize the entire purpose and the men that are working behind the scenes, the whole goal is to make all the religions one. And in these next slides that we're going to go through, 
you're going to see why, why and how they are doing that. So they have to make everybody, all religions equal, and they're having to do that by tearing down or deconstructing what we classify from the Bible as Christianity. Okay, so you can see from Paul Smith that what they want is a worldwide unity, a oneness. And that's going to be a union between Eastern and Western cultures with their way of thinking and including the spirituality. So you can see Wayne Teasdale, who's a monk, says that um, the church would no longer see members of other traditions that's outside of her life, mm. but she would promote the study of these traditions to seek common ground. Mm. This is where we are. We're trying to get to common ground, not just among Christians, Christians but among other belief systems. Ray Youngen summarized some of Alice Bailey's writings. And what he said about her was this, um, this unity of spiritual thought would be not a single one world denomination, but uh, multicultural unity and diversity, interfaith ecumenical agenda. Mm. So this, this emerging church is the bridge to ecumenism. It's an ecumenical path. Mm. And that's where they're trying to take us. This is who Ray Youngin is. He wrote these two young, um, these two books, The Time of Departing, and um, many, so many shall call in my name. What can yes. you explain? What ecumenical is? Ecumenical. That's a coming together when you bridge the gap between the, the their different religions. Mm -hmm. Is that all or one? Okay. Eric, you want to add to that? Yeah, there was um, Pope John Paul II years ago held a world religious leaders conference. I think it was in Assisi, Italy. And you can still find the video clips online. They had Native American Indian shamans. They had Buddhists. They had Hindus. They had Taoists. They had Shinto. They had every religion you can imagine. They all came to this meeting of world religions. And every one of those other world religious leaders bowed to the Pope and acknowledged him as the head of all religions in the world. This, this entire movement is to bring everyone back under the umbrella of Rome. And we know from, from Bible prophecy, that's going to be where Antichrist comes from. So all of these things we're seeing, that's the goal. Ecumenism is to unite not only all Christians, but to unite all religions as one. Yeah. So the core of the movement we may disagree with, but the coming together, the oneness, is that something that we disagree with as Christians? I assume that the text that they would use is John 17 verses uh, 21, when yes. Jesus is saying, be all in one just as yeah. i'm with the father mm -hmm. and there is a call to oneness when we're spreading the gospel it's to all the world so we can all come together and yes. await the second coming of christ but so it's a is there actually an issue with that or no it's an issue when you have to give up truth to to come together as one mm -hmm. that's compromise that's mm -hmm. no longer truth that's compromise and we're told to worship together in spirit and in truth mm -hmm. so we're throwing away truth and what kind of spirit are we left with in, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 through 6, listen to what God tells us. It says, Hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that says, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. He that saith he abideth in Christ ought himself also so to walk, even as Jesus walked. So what Candy just brought out is a good point. God wants us all to be one in Jesus, who is the word of God. We can't be one if we're walking two different directions. How can two walk together except they be agreed? We can't be one and be worshiping the same God if one person says homosexuality is not a sin and God's word says it is a sin or lying is not a sin, and God's word says lying is a sin. We can only become one as we abide in Christ, in God's word. A really good example of what we're seeing today, politically as well as spiritually, is we see all the leaders going over to the Pope, right, to get their orders or approval. Even Elon Musk, who is not a Christian, but who had these um, 
spirit guides when he was a little boy, these visitations, and yet he's going over to meet with the Pope. So there you have this coming together of all different beliefs um, acquiescing to the Pope. Mm, who put him in charge? <laughs> <laughs> True. All right. Okay, Swami Vivekananda, you read this one, Eric. This, this was powerful. This man was a Hindu guru or instructor. And this is what he said back in 1893 at the, uh, the address at the Parliament of Religions in Chicago. He said, the church also has a responsibility in our age to be a bridge for reconciling the human family. The spirit is inspiring her, speaking of the church, through the signs of the times to open to Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, Sheikhis, Johns or Jains, Taoists, Confucians, and indigenous peoples. And then he says the Christian is not to become a Hindu or a Buddhist, nor is a Hindu or a Buddhist to become a Christian, but each must assimilate the spirit of the others. That's terrifying. All right, Tony Jones. He says, so we must stop looking for some objective truth that is available when we delve into the text of the Bible. They do not like truth. Mm. They look at, at the current culture. They say, Jesus didn't live now. He lived back then. We need to reinterpret the Bible according to the current culture and what that means for us today. And they enter into these discussions. So that's, that's how they break down the word of God mm. is through, well, what would Jesus say today? And so through these conversations, um, faith gets undermined and the word of God gets undermined. I think what's scary is like in this day and age, especially with algorithms, it's very hard to mm. know what's true and what's not. Because I know mm. like when I was growing up and I had yeah. to do research papers, like whenever you Googled something, you would have both sides and you'd have to sort through those articles yourself. Mm. And then they always required us to have a counter um, argument in our papers and now it's like you research something and because the algorithm picks up on what it is that your point of view is it just feeds you that over and over mm -hmm. again and it's just like imagine if there's something because you know the the internet is actually a really good resource to help you um, understand the bible as well like if you just need more explanation on something you can read commentaries online and things but just imagine if all you see are just people's blogs showing up who you know are, are spreading misinformation about god's mm -hmm. word and it just becomes because that's another thing too with social media a lot of people are getting god's word online through the mouths of other people it's not even the bible itself mm -hmm. and so it's just really scary that's a good point like what you're gonna call truth mm -hmm. in this day and age because it's like it's like we're this this generation is going farther and farther away from the bible they don't even know how to interpret it they don't even know how to cry out for the holy spirit and they just they look to other people for answers and that's actually a very scary place to be in mm -hmm. yeah and another thing is that that's, that's a good point as a human beings we're not um created as a i mean yeah we have a brain and we, it's, it's like a computer but the thing is that to get my, uh, lots of information like you were saying like a you know air or truth all stuff i mean you go google something and they give you thousands of things to or even social media like you're saying it's a lot of information but the thing is that the word of god has said you need to know god through his word and through nature mm -hmm. and if you go yeah. in nature and go for a walk i mean it takes time for do two mm -hmm. miles mm -hmm. i mean mm -hmm. seriously this morning it was 30 minutes to go for a mile walking i was so <laughs> tired <I'm impressed. laughs> but, but the thing is that now is i mean you get you go like this for 30 minutes or 10 minutes I mean, you get like 500 different information and, and seriously, I mean, we're not, I mean, it's, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's no time to meditate on his word. Basically. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. like, go, 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 you know, it's and that's like, intentional. Take your time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So I asked Google once, not Google, but Alexa, Alexa knows everything, right? So I'm like, Alexa, <laughs> um, give me a Bible well, verse. She knows everything because she hears everything. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that's true. You're safe. <laughs> so yeah, it's like that's not in my database 
Mm-hmm. And that's that's how it is today. The Bible, God's word, is not in everybody's database. Wow. Mm-hmm. Um, Alan Jones says the church's fixation on the death of Jesus as a universal saving act must end, and the place of the cross must be reimagined in Christian faith. Why? Because of the cult of suffering and the vindictive God behind it. Oh, they do not like the atonement. Wow. They want to undermine the atonement. Um, so that, well, number one, they say it's it's like a jihadist kind of act. Some of the merchants talk about it and how violent God is. And that's not the God um, they serve. Mm-hmm. So they turn Jesus's atonement, his saving uh, sacrifice, sacrificial act for us into something that's horrible. Yeah. Because we don't need Jesus to get to heaven. There's more than one way. Mm-hmm. Right, Mercy. they don't even believe in heaven, but yes. So it's an attack on the atonement. This is from a, a powerful book called Ministry of Healing, page four twenty-eight and twenty-nine. It says these theories, followed to their logical conclusion, sweep away the entire Christian economy or the plan for man's salvation. They do away with the necessity for the atonement and they make man his own savior. Those who accept these theories may regard virtue as being better than vice, but having shut out God from his rightful position of sovereignty, they place their dependence upon human power, which without God is worthless. All of this is a deconstruction movement. It's like, it's so, it's meant to deconstruct your faith. Mm. and your belief and the and and even to the the power of claiming these promises if we don't believe the bible then we we're not going to be claiming promises over our lives to gain victory yeah for he hath made jesus christ to be sin for us who knew no sin so that we might be made the righteousness of god in him Mm. and that's how god sees us when we are under the blood of jesus and they overcame by the blood of the lamb that's how powerful the blood is the atonement and that's how we overcome. Mm. So what the emerging church does, as you can see it, it undermines faith. Um, it breaks down the dividing lines and tries to bring people together, right? So this is all a result of Vatican II. So Vatican II was in 1965. And there, was a, there wasn't a change in the doctrine. Mm. There was a change in the language and the liturgy. And that was to... Um, bring people together. So it was ecumenical approach. And so in the article from Chick Publications, what did the Vatican really change? It says the Second Vatican Council brought an important change in methods. It had been decided that Protestantism could be better eliminated by ecumenical unity than by the sword and the inquisitor's torch, no longer calling Protestants heretics, but renaming them separated brethren. That's that language softening. Mm -hmm. What happened with Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation? That turned the entire world upside down. I mean, we had the Dark Ages for 1260 years under the Roman Catholic Church. And when God spoke to this Roman Catholic you know, priest, Martin Luther, and began to shine the light of the gospel that a man is justified by faith in Christ Jesus and the blood he shed, all of a sudden light pierced the darkness and the roman church said we've got to destroy what protestantism and the reformation has done i don't really see the catholic church changing their stance or beliefs they may change the words but definitely not the core when it mm-hmm. comes to marriage or like human life mm-hmm. or all these different seemingly political things but they're really moral issues um so is it like a bait and switch where all these people come together, but they like the same thing that they're supposedly running away from is what the church has, the Catholic church has to offer. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. Short answer. Nice and sweet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, they, they actually said that it says Protestantism could be better eliminated by ecumenical unity than by the inquisition and the sword. Mm -hmm. So where Satan had tried to destroy the church from outside, he realized Mm -hmm. if I join them, I can corrupt them. 
Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Change it from the inside. Instead of trying to fight them with the sword, he said, I'll get in and I'll change the way they think. I'll undermine their belief in God's word as being absolute and being sure and being something you could stand on. And he, he's done more damage through that than he ever did through the other way. Yeah. And then you bring in the social gospel rather than the power of the gospel. So if you're joining together on, on unified projects, like bettering your community, then you're creating these relationships as well. And you're not teaching the Bible anymore. You're just teaching Jesus love. Um, from the same article, the changes made by the Second Vatican Council uh, were in liturgy, administrative practices, and most important, in ecumenicism. While admitting that other churches contain elements of truth, it repeated that the Roman Catholic Church is the only true church. So, Kendi, you're right. They don't change. Mm. Right? They change their tactics, Steph, but they don't change. Interject? If you would, explain to our viewers what the word liturgy actually means. Form of worship. They wanted to, to redo the way that we view the worship service. We'll get more into what it looks like, but that's what they wanted to do. You got to change the service, right? Otherwise, you're still doing the traditional way and teaching the traditional things. Okay, so this is Billy Graham uh, talking about uh, the Pope. It says, Graham received the Catholic International Franciscan Ward. So that's the other thing. These pastors and leaders and teachers, they join these interfaith mm. prayer breakfasts and such, mm -hmm. and they get together and then they're rewarded by the Pope. So they get a little pep and they get re rewarded and people respond to rewards. Right? If Martin Luther were alive today. Oh, right? <laughs> yeah. I actually just read, um, watched a documentary on that breakfast thing you're talking about oh. it was on netflix the family oh okay <laughs> yeah it talks about um all the politicians come together for this big breakfast and it happens on the local like level too service basically yeah it's true they pulpit swap but graham said in 1972 in acknowledging the award he said while i am not worthy to touch the shoelaces of saint francis <laughs> wow yet this same christ that called francis in the 13th century also called me to be one of his servants in the 20th century whose servants are mm. we to be mm. Jesus. he's yeah. he literally God. is quoting the bible i am not worthy to touch the mm -hmm. shoelaces john the baptist literally said mm. this to jesus that is yeah. wow do you know what's scary this is billy graham which i'm and i'm gonna be careful every person that we're that we're sharing a name of that is involved in this our honest our, our greatest desire is for them to see the truth, for their eyes to be open, for them to really surrender to Christ. So we're not condemning them, but we're saying what they're doing, what they're involved in is wrong. But Pastor Billy Graham, it says he received this award for, quote, his contribution to true ecumenism, the ecumenical movement, bringing all the religions together he got an award from the Pope for doing what the Vatican II Council wants done. And, and on a side note, I'm just going to interject this. Back a couple of hundred years ago, you had Catholics and Protestants within the Christian, quote, faith. You had Catholics and Protestants. It's very rare that you hear anybody use the word Protestant anymore. They say evangelical. The word evangelical has nothing to do with Christianity. The Buddhists claim to be evangelical. The Hindus claim on their own websites that they are evangelical. All the word evangelical means is you evangelize to convert people to your religion. The reason that that word evangelicals is being promoted now is because the Catholic Church doesn't want people identifying themselves as Protestants protesters against Rome. So he also said, since his election, Pope John Paul II has emerged as the greatest religious leader of the modern world. Yeah, and John Paul II, he was the one probably more so, he was called the people's pope. He was the one that everybody fell in love with. I mean, President Reagan was shaking hands with him and this was something that was not normal. Um, if you go back and you look at the, the history of America, 
we did not want Roman Catholicism coming back in and infiltrating this country because this country was set up as a Protestant nation. So we don't have anything against Catholic people, but we didn't want Roman Catholicism and the Vatican exercising her power and her teachings here. And Pope John Paul tore so many walls down, it was unbelievable. Charles Colson says that the spread of the charismatic through songs, prayers, and worship style going well beyond officially charismatic circles has done a great deal to reduce the barriers between Catholics and evangelicals. Mm -hmm. So you change the worship style, and this is the result. It's breaking down the walls. We're seeing a very different worship service than we did in the 60s, even in the 70s and 80s. It's, it's interesting because um, it doesn't say Pentecostal. It says charismatic. And what they have found, and you guys with Little Light Studios, you guys have revealed this. Advertising uses or exercises its greatest control through emotion. All advertising, all movies, all music exercises its greatest power on the human race through emotion. And so what the Vatican II Council recognized was the easiest way for us to infiltrate the Protestant churches is through a charismatic form of worship because it's emotional, not based on facts, not based on intellect, but on emotion alone. And even in today, and God is the one that created emotions. There's nothing wrong with emotions. When we sing, we ought to be full of joy. But what has happened now is, is that we are seeing churches of every denomination, and especially a lot of non-denominational, that have begun promoting a contemporary worship service, which is based primarily on emotion rather than the truth of God's word. You know, when you teach truth, it's not fun to hear always, and it can be boring and dry like they say that it is. Uh, if you don't love the Lord, then it's dry and boring, but that's their claim. But it transforms the heart. So we do get an experience when, when, to, when truth is taught, truth convicts, right? The Holy Spirit convicts, and then he cleanses us when we obey him, when we um, give up things that he wants us to give up or do this or whatever, when we follow him, that changes us. Hmm. Whereas this music, it gives us a, an emotional experience, but it doesn't transform the heart. So after the ser worship service, hmm. oftentimes they're more depressed, and I don't want to say depressed, but their emotions drop to a lower level than they had been before. So this this euphoria, and then there's this blah right? But the heart was never touched or transformed. All right. Phyllis Tickle was a big emergent um, leader. She's deceased now, but she says, if one were going to put one adjective to the great emergence and thereby one adjective to emergence Christianity, one would say de-institutionalized. Mm. And that's what it does. It just breaks down those walls. You come together on these worship services and we'll see in a little bit how this came to be. So would you welcome Tony Palmer to this platform. Bishop, thank you, sir. Bless you. Yes, sir. Amen. This is very important. We know that the first thousand years, there was one church. It was called the Catholic Church. And the word Catholic means universal. It doesn't mean Roman. Catholic means if you're born again, raise your hand if you're born again. You're a Catholic. Take back, redeem what belongs to you. We are Catholics. And then there was the split at the end of the first millennium. We had the Orthodox, the East and West, two churches. Then 500 years later, we have Luther and his protest. Three churches in 1,500 years. Three denominations, not three churches. And then from Luther's protest onwards, 33,000 new denominations. I've come to understand that diversity is divine. It's division that's diabolic.
It's true what you were saying about the glory. I agree with you, of course, it's true. The glory that the Father had, he gave to Jesus. The glory was the presence of God. What is the charismatic renewal? It's when we experience the presence of God. And he said, and I give them the glory, pragmatic reason, so that they may be one. It's the glory that glues us together, not the doctrines. Yeah, I mean, now I'll just say, I mean, now it's time to go back to Mother, Mother Church. They want us unified. The, you know, the, the protest is over, but they're, they're saying the words while they do the deconstruction. So Tony Paget says that the Bible is a scary book. It's subversive and it's scary and it needs to be deconstructed. These are your emergent leaders. Hmm. So Brian McLaren says the Bible is not considered an accurate, absolute authoritative or authoritarian source, but a book to be experienced. Uh, one can experience can be a, one, one experience can be as valid as any other can. Experience, dialogue, feelings and conversations are equated with scripture. He's a Christian. He has self He's a Christian. He's an emerging leader, emergent leader. Mm -hmm. huh? He is an author like over 60 books. So what is his source of truth? Um, probably the message. The message. They, a lot of the emergents use the message Bible. It's a misnomer. It's a paraphrase. Right. right? But it's still a Bible. Right. right? So a, if that's not accurate, absolute authoritative, then what is in, in your his... experience? Nothing. Yeah. What? Yeah. And people follow. So him. what and are you evan truth evangelizing people to your experience? You also have to recognize their experience. So when you look at kingdom, right, their definition of kingdom is different. So you and I believe the kingdom of God, right? Yeah. That's going to be in heaven. Right now, the kingdom is within us because he resides in us through his Holy Spirit. But their kingdom theology is different. When you, they believe in universalism. So everybody's saved, whether mm. you're um, Christian or non-Christian or atheist or a witch or whoever, you are saved. But heaven and hell are right here. There is okay. no heaven. It's just heaven is here, hell is here. What I'm doing, if I'm being kind to you, I'm bringing heaven to you. If I'm being mean to you, I'm bringing hell to you, right? It's your experience. So, but to evangelize, so to speak, to expand the kingdom here on earth, we just accept and embrace, accept and embrace. So the whole world, um, is saved, right? But you're saved within the context of your beliefs, whether you believe or not believe, whether you're a Wiccan, whether you're an atheist, whether you're a warlock, whatever. That's expanding the kingdom. Acceptance. We don't call people out because that's saying, I know more than you, right? I'm truth, you are not. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we can't give the three angels message we, we do that is that is what we do but that's why they don't want it given they don't want prophecy taught they don't want um you teaching people error because these people it, it's not error for them right so we're not calling them out of anything <laughs> right yes it undermines the that three angels you can, yeah read that whole quote finish that off because that that's powerful okay. Okay, experience, dialogue, feelings, and conversations are equated with scripture, while certitude, authority, and doctrine are to be eschewed. In other words, we, we cast them aside, right? It's my experience supersedes the Bible. Right, but you're also calling, they're calling their experience an authority, and they're, but. Yeah, but you have your authority too, because your experience is your authority. So then there is no error. Because what I believe is what I believe and is my no experience. Sin. There's no error and there's no sin. So then what are we it doing? It does away with I, the, I know, with the what sin. Is the, it does just, away with the law. If that's the case, let everyone live their lives. Like, why even come that together? That is the point. Just Except do what you. We're, we're, <laughs> there's there's, there's <laughs> unity in that we're all doing what we need to do. they make money? I mean, do you need to give donation to those people? I mean, No, unless you want to contribute to the social justice So it's just deceiving people. It's just like, oh, we're here. Unless it boils down to just being a good person. It keeps you from the truth, right? Satan wants to keep us from the truth. So if you're not if you're not seeking truth, mm. if the truth is not sanctifying you, then you are not being um, recreated, so to speak, mm -hmm. in the image of God. So you're not going to be ready for when Jesus comes. You're not going to be sealed. You mm -hmm. won't be saved. Mm -hmm. Satan doesn't care how he gets you, as long as he yeah. gets you. So they they cast down the word of God, and then anything goes. Right. So
you know, there is no right or when you take the Bible out, there is no right or wrong. So I, I still don't see any hope in this. I mean, it's just it's just a deconstruction. Just, that's all I see. That's yeah. really just a break. Exactly. That's literally I don't see yes. any other thing now, than we have to break is a down. step. Yeah. Right. So that's the emerging church. And then you move into um, convergence. So when you've when you've undermined their faith, when you've created doubt in the word of God, then you bring them together. What are you going to bring them together with? Well, that's mm. the worship styles. That's um, acts of service, that sort of thing. Just mm. just be good. Just do good. One of the things that I think Candy or Brittany just asked a minute ago about, I don't see any hope. If you've got somebody that's living under guilt because of their sins, the biblical way of dealing with that guilt is for them to have faith in what Christ did in taking their sins and giving them a new life and giving them victory over that sin. But for the emergence, instead of doing that, they say the other way to get rid of guilt is just get rid of the law. So people say, there's the hope. And that's scary. The Bible says that, you know, adulterers and fornicators and homosexuals and liars and murderers are going to have their part in the lake of fire. But if I can tell people, well, murdering's not really that big a deal and homosexuality's not really that big a deal, you won't surely die. Then all of a sudden they can be free from guilt and continue right on living in sin. And like Stephanie brought out, they won't be ready to meet the Lord. Yeah, this is a powerful statement from a book called Acts of the Apostles. It says, to many, the Bible has become as a lamp without oil because they have turned their minds into channels of speculative belief that bring misunderstanding and confusion. The work of higher criticism in dissecting, conjecturing, reconstructing is destroying faith in the Bible as a divine revelation. These practices, like we've just been looking at, are robbing God's word of its power to control, uplift, and inspire human lives. By spiritualism, multitudes are taught to believe that desire or your experience is the highest law that licenses liberty and that man is accountable only to himself. From this deconstruction movement, we, we became a mega church nation, right? Mm -hmm. So how did the mega church get here? So that was by leadership network from the eighties, Bob Buford and Peter Drucker formed leadership network. Now it was a, it was a broker to the churches, a resource broker to the churches. So Peter Drucker, was a businessman and Bob Buford. Um, I think they were both business actually. So what happened was the church partnered with leadership network. And by the way, they still do these things today. Conferences will um, bring leadership network programs into the churches so that they can grow their churches. Right? So instead of teaching truth and prophecy, which impacted my life as a child and converted me, um, they say it's too scary. We just need to bring people together. So what they do was did was they created a research um, data. So what do the people want? This is the seeker friendly church, right? Mm -hmm. What do the seeker want? Do the mm -hmm. seekers want? So they want coffee. They want basically a social club. They just want to hang out. Uh, they want good music. They want a little short sermonette. And so that's how this came to be they did the marketing and um and created this mega church thing so they were looking at numbers and it's a it's based on the psychosocial change theory so there again god doesn't change right but satan is constantly changing and so this is a tactic mm -hmm. that they used bob buford on his previous website had occultists and mystics like Jim Collins taking a new age spiritual course. You could um, contact spirit guides, use tarot cards for spiritual guidance. And that's from um, a really good video, Submerging Church documentary. So it's... So inside the church, they were practicing their stuff? They, these are the people who came together to broker to the churches. So they, they themselves oh, okay. were doing things like this. And so this is the spiritual influence 
behind this brokerage option for for the churches so when if i invite these people who are doing these things into my church what oh. spirit am i bringing in okay. right so these were influencing the people who were bringing in um mm. the the how to's how to build your religion and so peter drucker actually was rick warren's mentor for like 20 years so they speak the same language so mm. these people are mentoring our pastors and he said uh peter drucker says that even a stool needs three legs religion government and businesses are to work together does this sound familiar to you at all and then his understudy rick warren says the third leg of the stool is the churches there's a public sector role there's a private sector role and there's a faith sector role so they're trying to merge um, politics and religion and business do you think that these people actually know what they're doing or do you believe that they're deceived? I, you know, only God knows the heart. I just have to look at what they put out and compare it to the word of God and say, does okay. it line up? You would know it. Right. You would know them by their fruit, right? That's right. I mean, if it's yeah. not according to God's word, I mean, they're liars. Yeah. I mean, look at the things they're teaching uh, and they don't line up with the word of God. But it sounds good. It sounds good, right? Bring everybody yeah. together and make them happy. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's fine. Social gatherings are fine. Yeah. So we're communal beings by our makeup, by our nature. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the church and the responsibility of the church, the purpose of the church mm -hmm. and what God has called us to do, it's not just about handing out coffee so that there's a bunch of numbers in the building. The numbers bring money, though. <laughs> <laughs> John 12 verse 32, if I, and I is Jesus, if I be lifted up from the earth, he, I will draw all men unto me. So it's, Christ should be the marketing factor, not the, not be, the coffee, right? you know what I mean? Well, yeah. they reconstruct Christ. I'm surprised we haven't even seen that. I would have thought they would have redefined who Christ was. That's what they're rather doing. Than tear apart. Very good. That is what they're doing. They're redefining the church, they're yeah. reimagining church, re redefining who Christ is. And you'll see their de definition of Christ is going to be very different mm. than who we read about in the Bible. So Basil Pennington says that we should not hesitate to take the fruit of the age old wisdom of the East and capture it for Christ. Indeed, those of us who are in ministry should make the necessary effort to acquaint ourselves with as many of these Eastern techniques as possible. Remember, we, we kind of began the, the program with a slide talking about it was a, a merging with Christianity with Eastern religion mm -hmm. and way of thinking. And that's what we're seeing. There's, and there's a purpose there's a purpose for that because the Bible in prophecy, in the book of Daniel and in Revelation, it reveals at the end of the world the power that is going to be controlling the majority of the human race will be the Roman Catholic Church. And you think, okay, so I, I can understand Baptists going back to Rome. I can understand Methodists going back to Rome. I can understand Seventh-day Adventists I can see them shaking hands with the Roman power, but how are you going to get the Muslims, the Buddhists, the Taoists, the Hindus? The Buddhists, the Taoists, and Hindus are the world's greatest percentage population wise. How are you going to get, they could care less about Jesus. How are you going to get them to go back to Rome? Well, that's why Rome saw that they have to merge eastern mystical spirituality with protestantism because through that blending of eastern religion and protestantism and roman catholicism you gather all in one and that's what they're doing this was interesting to me and and you can still find the video clips of the actual sermon that rob bell gave and this is a quote from one of his messages, he said, now from way back when our ancestors understood that there's something divine about our breath. Well, wait a minute, from way back when, what are you quoting from? You, he didn't give a Bible reference there. What he's actually talking about is the desert fathers, the, the Catholic mystics, that's what he's talking about. 
He said, from way back when our ancestors understood there's something, quote, divine about our breath. They believe there's something sacred and holy about the very act of breathing. That's new age Eastern mysticism through the roof. Uh, in spiritual formation, we had something called breath prayers. I didn't do it. I thought it was weird. I don't know why that and not anything else, but um, it, you would say a prayer like, um, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. You would breathe out first part, breathe in second part. So it's a cyclical breathing repeating, right? Mm -hmm. And they would say that you are actually breathing in the spirit of God, the presence of God. And it's weird because in that type of breathing, which the Buddhist and the Hindus both do and the Taoists, they use the breath and the focus on breath in order to achieve an altered state of consciousness, which opens the mind for the influence of evil spirits. Rob Bell went on and he said, central to the Christian tradition for thousands of years have been dis disciplines of meditation, reflection, silence, and breathing. And the yoga masters say, this is how it is when you follow Jesus and surrender to God. And then he said, I wonder sometimes when we feel as though God is far, God is thinking, I gave you breathing, I can't get closer. This is a pastor, a well-known, hugely influential pastor in the emergent church movement that is teaching people to do yoga. And that opens the door. The word yoga literally means to be yoked or joined in union with the Hindu god Brahma. And he's teaching that. So it brings everybody together as one. Well, I don't know about this pastor or the yoga masters, but every time Jesus wanted God's presence, he just asked for it. Right. Lord, please come. Amen. We come into his presence. Or mm -hmm. before a miracle, mm -hmm. just ask. Mm -hmm. Call upon me and I will be there. Mm -hmm. That's right. Good Amen. point. Much about it. <laughs> we don't have to make it complicated or, you know, uh, wow. Mystical. Either. Right. Yeah. yeah. One of one of the things that that we realized, especially when Stephanie and I were were putting these together, if you can lead people to believe that all paths lead to God no matter what path that is, if it's if Native American religion, if it's Aztecs, if it's Mayan, if it's Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, whatever, if you can make people believe that every path leads to the same place and they call that God, then that means all religions are equally valid. And again, then you don't have to convert anybody. You don't have to call anybody out of Babylon, out of their other religions. It's also saying that God can't make up his mind, mm. that he can't just be direct and straight with us. He's leaving us to figure it out. And also when it comes to someone who's just now entering into this, it's so overwhelming. Well, which one do I do? And you know, what works for me? And oh no, I've made a mistake or this feels terrible. And it's just like, you're left just in the ocean drowning, not having any direction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here we have Chardin again, Talhar de Chardin. He says, I believe that the Messiah whom we await, whom we all without any we whom we all without any doubt await is the universal Christ, that is to say, the Christ of evolution. Yeah, when it when it says the Christ of evolution, the New Agers and the Hindus and the Buddhists and many of the Catholic hierarchy believe that we are all evolving into Christhood. They believe that this, this wisdom that you talked about earlier, that once you tap into this universal mind or this universal wisdom, that you become a, quote, Christ figure. So that's what they're looking for, is man becoming a god again. Like, not again like we ever were, but again, as in that's what Satan told Eve in the Garden of Eden ye shall be as gods. In Desire of Ages, we're told when Satan has undermined faith in the Bible, which we've just seen, he then directs men to other sources for light and power. And thus he insinuates himself. That's how he gets in. 
those who turn from the plain teaching of the scripture and the convicting power of God's Holy Spirit are inviting the control of demons. Um, instead of opposing Christianity, the occult would capture and blend itself with Christianity. You were wondering where this was going. This is this is where it's taking mm, us. Okay. Um, and then use it as its primary vehicle for spreading and instilling new age consciousness. The various churches would still have their outer trappings of Christianity and still use much of the same ling lingo. If asked certain questions about traditional Christian doctrine, the same answers would be given, but it would all be on the outside. On the inside, a contemplative spirituality, a Christian jacket, but void of God. Mm. And then we have um, reached number nine of Alice Bailey's 10 point plan. Uh, this 10 point plan the UN adopted when it formed. And so number 10 is create an interfaith movement. Promote other faiths to be at par with Christianity and break this thing about Christianity as being the only way to heaven. By that, Christianity will be pulled down and other faiths promoted. Wow. This is the goal. What's crazy is the progression because sometimes you don't even see yourself. Like when you first hear about this, you think, that's crazy. <laughs> There's no <laughs> way I'm going to be a part of that. Right. But when you've been basically indoctrinated, <laughs> <laughs> through media and all these different things you just end up find yourself like finding yourself slowly believing one thing after the next after the next and you just end up there this is the un worship room so I, have you seen a picture of the worship that room before so okay very cool um <laughs> so it, really when you when you think about who god is he's reduced to a light and this light uh, actually represents lucifer and then you have the eye of Ra, you have all sorts of things. And that is an altar. And what do you sacrifice? The, oh, not what do you sacrifice? <laughs> <laughs> Yourself. Um, and there's a quote that Hammerskold, I, don't, I know I'm not pronouncing that right, but um, it was the, the man who formed this and planned every piece of it. And he says, but the stone in the middle of the room has more to tell us. We may see it as an altar, Empty, not because there is no God, but because it is an altar to an unknown God, but because it is dedicated to the God who man worships under many names and in many forms. Right now, churches of all denominations, I mean, like you can look it up online, Baptist, Methodist, Seventh-day Adventist, almost all of them are saying we're losing church members. We're losing church members, not just the young people, there's people that have been in the churches for 30 years and they're walking out the door. And do you know where most of them are going? To one of either New Age or Eastern mystical practices. And the reason why is because in their churches, they have had a form of godliness, but not the power. It, it's been, they, they get up in the morning, they're told you need to spend an hour each morning with the Lord or 30 minutes each morning. So they open their Bible and it's just words on a printed page. It's just blah, blah, blah. And they read it and they and they go, I've done this for 20 years. It hasn't changed anything in my life. And they walk away because they find or they're introduced to something that gives them a spiritual experience. What they don't realize is that if we will surrender to what God is telling us in his word, we will then experience God's presence inside of us, just as the apostles and disciples did. But if we if we read, but we won't do what his word says, God can't get inside. It's when we surrender and we open the door of our heart and allow God's word to live in us that we have that experience of his presence. That's why many people are turning to Eastern mysticism and those type of spiritual experiences. And I believe that we need a revival. We do. And the revival, Amen. sometimes we're thinking like, oh, yeah, I mean, the church's obligation to come out with something, you know, some program. And it's wonderful, the churches, uh, to do that revival for the whole congregation. But I believe that revival, we need to seek individually and start in us Amen. first. Mm -hmm. So if we don't start with our, like, 
he, you know, Eric said, saying like, oh, it was one hour and that's it. But yeah, that's great. But you need to have the experience. You need to say like, you know what? Yeah. In that moment that you go through life, temptation or whatever is up there and you one personal life. If you don't say Jesus come with us, come with me, help me with this problem. We help me with mm -hmm. this. Sin. It's going to be the same. No power. There's no power and mm -hmm. and, and, and your faith. So rev uh, f false revivals is coming, right? And yes. then before Jesus come. Yes. So it's going to be crazy. It's going to be crazy out there. If you're a Christian, just wait a little bit because you got to be thinking like, oh, you know what? It's an amazing revival with it. But yeah, uh, it's going to be mixed. It's yes. going to be very mixed. And, and I think it has to be you and God. The revival, mm -hmm. it has yeah. to be starting mm -hmm. in us first. And mm -hmm. rooted in the word and not just music. Amen. Yes. Oh. Word, the word is life. Yeah. That's true. Mm -hmm. We need to be in the word, mm -hmm. not in the music. Yeah. Well, I, I was just going to encourage those of, of our brothers and sisters that are watching right now, please go on Little Light Studios on our YouTube channel there and type in Coming of the Cosmic Christ because that program that we did will really, really add to what we've been talking about here. It's like, yeah, the, the two discussions really help each other. So that, that one film will really make a difference. Okay. Uh, Eric, if someone would like to get in contact with you, reach you in any way, how can they do that? Um, our, the easiest way is through our website. It's isaiahministries.online. And just go to the contact and, and it'll let you send us an email. And then I'll, I'll get back in touch with you, usually within a few days to a week at the most. Okay. And what about you, Stephanie? Do you have any platforms? Sure. Um, I have a website, sgriffin.org. And then Facebook and you know, Instagram and YouTube, Stephanie Griffin Ministries. Awesome. And email, Stephanie Griffin Ministries at Gmail. Well, thank you both so much for being on the show here today yeah, and sharing mm -hmm. all these insights. Just another reminder of how on guard we need to be mm -hmm. as Christians. Always be ready and willing to share our faith, but mm -hmm. also to stand against, be strong and firm in our faith and stand against the deceptions that we see. Thank you so much for viewing the show, supporting us through not just watching, but hopefully liking and subscribing as well. If you'd like to do that financially, you can do that through Patreon, patreon.com slash Little Light Studios, or through our website, littlelightstudios.tv, and you'll have access to exclusive content from us, as well as perks like uh, private t-shirts and things like that. But we also have t-shirts available on the broad scale. You can visit lightwear.shop. Thank you so much for watching, and we will see you next week on LED Live. Bye-bye. <laughs>